Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we delve into the groundbreaking narrative of Valley of Genius, a thrilling exploration of Silicon Valley's remarkable journey from the inception of the personal computer to the contemporary landscape of social media innovation. Embark on an exhilarating venture through the epochs of technological revolution and cultural shifts that have defined the digital age. Authored by Adam Fisher, an esteemed thinker with a keen eye on technology's trajectory, Valley of Genius is a testament to his extensive research and rich contribution to publications such as Wired, MIT Technology Review, and the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Fisher's sharp analysis and vivid storytelling encapsulate the spirit and struggle inherent to the birthplace of modern tech. This book is an essential read for anyone fascinated by the historical progression of the devices we depend on daily, individuals intrigued by the unique culture within the tech community, and readers who revel in stories rich with ambition, innovation, and dynamic personalities. Join us to unpack the collective genius that reshaped our world, one breakthrough at a time. At a Valley of Genius, the uncensored history of Silicon Valley, as told by the hackers, founders, and freaks who made it boom. Introduction. Discover the mavericks behind the screen. The true story of Silicon Valley innovation. Picture Silicon Valley, and you might conjure up images of sleek office buildings and billionaires in turtlenecks. But beyond the veneer of venture capital and stock options lies a vibrant saga of human ingenuity, ambition, and sometimes sheer audacity. This isn't just a story of money and markets. It's one about gutsy individuals who dared to dream big and transform those visions into reality. Welcome to Silicon Valley, the pulsating heart of technological progress nestled in a corner of Northern California. More than a mere geographical location, it's a crucible where, since the 1960s, the future has been continually reimagined and reinvented. Here, personal computing took its first steps. The internet emerged from the ether, and the smartphone leaped from imagination into our palms. Innovations that define the modern world have their roots in this fertile ground. The true essence of Silicon Valley lies not in its economic statistics, but in its people. Bright, bold, sometimes eccentric, often young, who did more than just put in the hours. They lived their work, sometimes pulling all-nighters, fueled by passion, pizza, and yes, even psychedelic inspiration. In this narrative, we'll dive into the lives of those who were there when tech history was made. We'll learn about the garage-born enterprises that skyrocketed to the Fortune 500 and how a company like Xerox inadvertently unlocked the potential of modern computing. We'll uncover how a Silicon Valley visionary nearly preempted the smartphone revolution by a decade, and why the masterminds behind Google were initially reluctant entrepreneurs. Now, let's embark on a journey through time and innovation to discover the beating heart of Silicon Valley and the genius that lays hidden in its valley. Part 1. The Rise and Fall of Atari, a Silicon Valley Cautionary Tale In the annals of Silicon Valley, Few stories capture the imagination like the swift descent and the stunning decline of Atari, the company that arguably set off the first great tech boom. At the helm was Nolan Bushnell, a visionary whose gamble on electronic entertainment forged an entire industry. Bushnell's love affair with technology began with a covert midnight rendezvous with Space War, one of the earliest computer games. That encounter sparked an epiphany fueling Bushnell's resolve to explore the untapped potential of these digital diversions. Fast forward to the creation of Atari, and the stage was set for a radical shift in entertainment. Beneath the simple exterior of Atari's first breakout hit, Pong, lay the seeds of a cultural revolution. With rudimentary graphics mimicking table tennis, Pong's arcade machine quickly became more than a game. It grew into a social phenomenon. The sign of its explosive success was comically mundane, 
The first machine choked on its own prosperity, its coin box bloated with quarters from enthusiastic players. To keep up with the insatiable demand for Pong, Atari's fledgling team toiled ceaselessly, embodying the blend of dedication and rebellion that would come to characterize Silicon Valley's workplace culture. Yet, even as they innovated and iterated, Atari's office air was tinged with more than just solder. Marijuana and mirth mixed freely, and professional decorum often took a back seat to hedonism. But when Warner Communications acquired Atari for a cool $30 million in 1976, the freewheeling ethos collided with corporate reality. The company, which by then had diversified into pioneering home video game consoles, faced an identity crisis. At the heart of this was the stark juxtaposition between Bushnell's rebellious streak, infamously showcased in sartorial form, and the corporate mannerisms of Ray Kasser, the straight-laced CEO drafted from the fashion industry. As traditional corporate governance clashed with Atari's libertine spirit, the rifts grew. Disillusioned engineers, who felt alienated by the changing ethos, began to abandon ship. Without its core innovators, Atari struggled to keep pace with the rapidly evolving industry it had helped spawn. By 1984, the pioneer of the video game craze lay in pieces, its empire fragmented and sold. The tale of Atari serves not just as a chronicle of triumph and setback, but as a parable for the delicate balance between creative chaos and the need for sustainable structure in the high-stakes playground of Silicon Valley. Part 2. The Forgotten Giant. How Xerox Pioneered the Personal Computer Revolution. If someone dropped the trivia question about the birthplace of the personal computer, most would likely shoot their hands up with Apple or IBM on their lips. But in the annals of tech history, it was Xerox, the very emblem of photocopying, that first glimpsed the potential of modern personal computing. In the early 1970s, Xerox's famed facility, the Palo Alto Research Center, known simply as Park, was a hive of innovation. It was here that the concept of a computer morphed from a rigidly mathematical tool to a visually focused device designed for the user. The spark for this shift was lit by engineers like Bob Taylor, who proclaimed the bold vision that the future of computers was personal, would be about communication, and would hinge on a visual interface. You've got to see it to believe it, might well have been the motto for the creations of Park. Enter the Alto, a marvel of its time, with a slew of features that are now second nature. It boasted overlapping windows, a buffet of fonts, an array of icons and menus that beckoned with the promise of simplicity. Its bitmap display was a revelation that ushered in the era of digital artistry, with images gracing its screen, a canvas for pixels. But what good is vision if you cannot navigate it? While the Alto's mouse was more of a prototype, clunky and unpolished, it signaled the dawn of direct interaction with this visual frontier, a leap from the bygone era of punch cards and flashing cursor prompts. Hot on the heels of the Alto came the Bravo, sporting a vivid palette of 256 colors that turned the monochrome world of computing into a kaleidoscope. This new age machine captivated those who saw beyond mere data processing, inviting creators and dreamers to paint the night with digital brushstrokes. Yet, Xerox itself hesitated at the edge of this brave new world, clinging to the familiar shores of the printing industry. The culture clash between the conservative corporate image and the freewheeling innovation of Park was stark. Leaders failed to capitalize fully on this deep well of technology, instead allowing the blueprint of personal computing to pass into other hands. One of those hands belonged to the eccentric and visionary Steve Jobs, who, during a fateful visit to Park, glimpsed the future. A future that Apple would one day claim as its own. Though Xerox itself may not have become the flag bearer of the personal computer, the seeds it sowed at Park left an indelible mark, shaping an industry and changing the world. Part 3. From Outlaws to Innovators. The Making of Apple's Founding Duo. 
The tales of Silicon Valley are often bathed in serendipity and sprinkled with rebellion, a narrative that perfectly frames the origin story of Apple's founders, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. In the tech world's primordial soup that was the Valley in the 1970s, these two pioneers formed a bond that would ultimately alter the course of technology. Before they crafted the legacy of Apple, Jobs and the Woz flirted with the edges of legality, building and peddling blue boxes, clandestine devices capable of mimicking the tones used by the telephone system to allow free long-distance calls. Wozniak, the engineering brain, developed these digital lockpicks, while Jobs, with his keen business instincts, saw the potential of selling them. It was a partnership with a future, though at the time, neither foresaw an empire in the making. Jobs found himself at Atari, not entirely in his element, and soon after, embarked on a journey in search of enlightenment in India. When he returned to the valley, his exterior transformed, Jobs sought to reclaim his position at Atari. Nolan Bushnell acquiesced but relegated Jobs to the night shift, a strategic move that tacitly invited Wozniak's nighttime participation, effectively enlisting the expertise of two Steves for the price of one. The nocturnal playground of Atari's office became a canvas for the two Steves. Here, Jobs received the assignment for a new game, Breakout. Bushnell wagered on Wozniak's tacit involvement, and indeed, the game's engineering brilliance bore Wozniak's unmistakable signature. As fate would have it, the collaborative spark kindled over illegal blue boxes and arcade games evolved into a groundbreaking venture. Wozniak, fueled by the technical genius he observed at Xerox and empowered with Atari remnants, assembled the personal computer that would become the Apple One jobs, ever the opportunist with an eye for market trends, proposed the idea that would seal their destinies. They would form their own company. In a storied partnership intertwining the renegade and the entrepreneur, Apple Computers was conceived. It was a union that not only heralded a new era for personal computing, but also etched the legacy of two maverick minds into silicon history. Part 4. How Apple's iconic Macintosh was born from Xerox's vision and a stroke of marketing genius. By the late 1970s, Apple had begun to carve its niche in the burgeoning tech landscape. Yet, the true leap forward, the one that would cement the Apple legacy, came from a bold encounter with Xerox's innovation married to a marketing campaign of epic proportions. The setting was Xerox Park, a playground of technological advancements that were largely underappreciated by its parent company. Steve Jobs, with his uncanny prescience, sought a peek into Park's developments, offering Xerox a piece of the apple pie in exchange for a tour. It was during this fateful visit in December 1979 that Jobs laid eyes on the Alto and its graphical user interface, a revelatory moment that reshaped his vision of the personal computer's future. Struck by the intuitive simplicity of the Alto's mouse, Jobs foresaw a world where such interfaces were universal. This inspiration was the catalyst for a profound transformation at Apple. The company embraced the graphical user interface, introducing concepts like the desktop, icon, and mouse into mainstream vernacular. The culmination of this vision was the Macintosh, launched in 1984. More than just a computer, the Macintosh was Jobs' avowal of technology's potential to be both empowering and enjoyable. For its grand introduction, Jobs insisted on advertising that matched the Macintosh's revolutionary spirit. Enter Ridley Scott's Orwellian spectacle that graced the screens during the 1984 Super Bowl, an advertisement casting a defiant athlete shattering Big Brother's image a metaphor for Apple's own crusade against the monolithic IBM. The ad made waves, dominating headlines and news broadcasts as though it were itself a newsworthy event. But the spectacle was not confined to television screens. At the unveiling, Jobs extracting the Macintosh from its satchel, a magician revealing his final trick, was more than just a reveal. It was a statement. 
As Jobs retreated, the Macintosh greeted the awestruck crowd with a cheerful, Hello! announcing its arrival in a voice that would echo through the annals of tech history. Apple had not only heralded a new era of personal computing, but had captured the imaginations of the masses, confirming its role as a beacon of innovation and a master of the art of presentation. Part 5, The Untold Prodigy of General Magic, Pioneering the Smartphone, A Decade Early Before smartphones became an extension of our very selves, there was a visionary company conjuring the future in the shadows. Not Apple, but a lesser-known trailblazer named General Magic. Launched in 1990 as an offshoot of Apple, General Magic was conceived by the brilliant minds who had crafted the Macintosh. In their pursuit of innovation, they envisioned a device that was nothing short of prophetic, the personal communicator. This nascent concept of a smartphone boasted features that today are ubiquitous. Email, phone calls, instant messaging, replete with emojis, an app store, a camera attachment, essentials of our digital identities that we now take for granted. The birthplace of this extraordinary device was a workplace as eccentric as the vision it harbored. General Magic occupied an abode that was more akin to a wilderness lodge, complete with a decade-abandoned office space and a basement prowled by feral dogs. The spirit of Silicon Valley's quirkiness was alive and well, from an office-dwelling rabbit to late-night musings by engineer Zarko Dragonik that left colleagues amused and perplexed. The personal communicator was a portal to a yet unrealized world, a desktop to write on, virtual filing cabinets, and doorways to networked games all made digital. But as groundbreaking as it was, this device was mired in its own ambition its necessity for a physical connection to a phone line, unanticipated bulkiness, and lackluster battery life were telling signs that the technology of the day couldn't quite catch up with the dreams of its creators. The market's cold reception to the personal communicator and the company's subsequent demise could have been the end of general magic. However, the seeds of greatness planted within its walls proved fertile. The geniuses at its core went on to shape not only Apple's iPhone, but also the Android ecosystem. Among the tech luminaries, one unassuming figure tread a path that diverged from mobile phones, yet his work was no less transformative. Pierre Omidyar and his small venture Auction Web, a humble precursor to the e-commerce colossus known as eBay. In its fleeting existence, General Magic laid down the foundation for the future and dispersed a cadre of talent across Silicon Valley. While the company's place in history might be overshadowed by the products it inspired, its shadow stretches long, reaching into the pockets and palms where now rests the legacy of a true visionary collective. Part 6. eBay. From Weekend Code to Global Marketplace Revolution. Long before he became a celebrated entrepreneur, Pierre Omidyar was a dreamer who trusted in the decency of humanity and the transformative power of free markets. It was this idealistic perspective that fueled the creation of an endeavor destined to become a household name, eBay. eBay began its journey not with grand fanfare, but as the product of a Labor Day weekend coding spree, inspired by an offhand remark about the coolness of an online auction platform. This no-frills marketplace launched with the trust-based assumption that people would honor their commitments in transactions, echoing Omidyar's own faith in collective integrity. His conviction paid off as eBay quickly captured the imagination and trust of internet users. Growth wasn't just steady. It was explosive. From the humble beginnings of a daily 25-cent listing arriving in the main, eBay's financial inflow surged swiftly overtaking Omidyar's day job earnings. The monumental fact that eBay has maintained profitability every quarter since inception is a testament to its remarkable appeal and resilience. Beyond revolutionizing online commerce, eBay's legacy includes a pivotal innovation, the feedback system. In a digital world where anonymity was the norm, Omidyar understood the critical need for a mechanism to cultivate trust and reputation among strangers. 
Thus, the Feedback Forum emerged, a seemingly obvious yet pioneering tool at the time that permitted users to rate and review their transactional experiences. This system didn't merely contribute to eBay's success. It sculpted the very cornerstone of today's online exchange culture. By 1998, just three years from its experimental birth, eBay went public, its shares soaring, enriching early backers with an astonishing return. This meteoric ascension set the stage for the next titan of industry, Google, to make its mark. But the roots of such rapid growth and pervasive influence can be traced back to Omidyar's vision, a vision that remade the way the world buys, sells, and trusts in the virtual marketplace. Part 7. Against All Odds, The Unintended Birth of Google Larry Page and Sergey Brin, two Stanford graduate students, bound by curiosity and an appetite for invention, birthed Google not out of a desire to dominate the search engine space, but as a byproduct of academic intrigue. Page, seduced by the prospects of self-driving vehicles, and Brin, alongside Page, fancied the idea of a space tether, a fantastical elevator to the stars. Their collaborative energies, however, congealed around a scholarly pursuit to chronicle and comprehend the labyrinthine expanse of the internet. In an era when search engines like Yahoo and Alta Vista were already household names, Page and Brin did not set out to eclipse them. To these doctoral candidates, a new search engine smacked less of innovation and more of redundancy. That is, until a revelation struck Larry Page. The value of a web page could be measured by the number and quality of its inbound links. Armed with this insight, it took a mere eight weeks for the duo to conjure a search engine that surpassed its forebears in efficacy and accuracy. Their ambition, at that juncture, was limited to licensing their technology. The world of business held little appeal when set against the lure of academic discovery. However, their encounter with Excite CEO George Bell exposed the stark superiority of their creation. When Internet was queried, Excite coughed up an unintelligible slew of links while Google proffered pristine, relevant results. Strangely, Bell rebuffed their advances. His search engine's inefficiency tethered users to the site, precisely the outcome he favored. Despite their licensing efforts meeting with indifference, Page and Brin were confronted with an irrefutable realization. Their search engine was in a league of its own. The path forward, previously unentertained, now unfurled before them. They established Google, setting in motion a narrative that would reshape not merely an industry, but the very fabric of information access worldwide. So began the unexpected and meteoric rise of Google, a company forged in the fires of knowledge, kindled by the sparks of serendipity and fueled by an innovation so profound it became indispensable to the digital age. Part 8. Apple's pivot from isolation to integration ignited its resurgence. In the vista of Silicon Valley's history, the tale of Apple's rebound from the brink is a testament to adaptability. By the late 90s, the once-dazzling Macintosh had become a faint glow amidst a sea of competitors. Apple found itself gripping a meager 2% of the personal computer market, until Steve Jobs, like a prodigal founder, returned to the helm. With Jobs' second advent at Apple, winds of change began to stir. The aesthetically striking iMac emerged, donning a revolutionary translucent shell, and the iPod slid into the market. However, in stark contrast to its chic design, the iPod initially floundered, a direct consequence of Apple's walled garden philosophy, which required iPod owners to have a Mac. The turning point was a bold deviation from the closed system doctrine. Persuaded by his team, Jobs agreed to bridge iTunes with Windows, effectively swinging open the gates of the iPod ecosystem to a vast new audience. The decision bore fruit spectacularly, billions rolled in weekly, and Apple seized an overwhelming 90% of the music player market share. Yet, Standing still is moving backward in Silicon Valley. 
Eyes now set on the iPhone, Apple embarked on a frantic race, spurred on by Jobs' dread of potential rivals merging phones with music players. The initial iPhones might have faltered in telephony. They had engineers lamenting over their dialing woes. But Jobs saw beyond the calls. He saw a device with the potential to dethrone laptops. The launching platform for the iPhone was glittering with anticipation, yet backstage there was an undercurrent of panic. Software hastily cobbled together threatened to unravel before the audience. Yet, the stars aligned. The iPhone launch was hailed as a triumph. Even so, Jobs initially rebuffed the idea of opening up the iPhone to third-party apps, anxious to protect the integrity of the device. However, Google's Android burst onto the scene, brandishing its open doors for developers, and Jobs, feeling the heat, agreed to cultivate a more open ecosystem for the iPhone. Steve Wozniak, Apple's unsung co-founder, recognized the third-party app store as a milestone surpassing the iPhone itself. It heralded an era of unprecedented innovation and connectivity. In hindsight, it's almost inconceivable to imagine an iPhone devoid of apps like Facebook, yet it serves as a reminder of the era's rapid technological and cultural shifts. Apple's ascendance to a tech titan was catalyzed not just by innovation, but also through strategic decisions to embrace openness and expand its ecosystem, a move that has defined Apple's continued success in a competitive digital landscape. Part 9. From Harvard Dorm to Global Dominance, the Unstoppable Rise of Facebook. In an age before social media ubiquity, the idea of effortlessly finding someone's photo online was a novelty. At Harvard, the only semblance of this was through Facebooks, paper directories specific to each dorm. That was until Mark Zuckerberg and Dustin Moskowitz foresaw the potential of a unified digital directory, the seedling that would burgeon into the behemoth known as Facebook. With a nascent version of the Facebook up and running, Zuckerberg and Moskowitz embarked on a pilgrimage to Silicon Valley, determined to morph their college project into a bona fide corporation. The company's early doctrine, move fast and break things, was not mere corporate jargon but a lived ethos. Engineers would deploy freshly minted code live into the twilight hours, standing on guard to douse any resultant fires till the break of dawn. In Facebook's formative years, features that have since become the lifeblood of the platform were unleashed with lightning speed. The 2006 advent of the newsfeed was nothing short of a revolution, transforming the user experience from a hunt and peck venture to a dynamic stream of updates dished out directly to users. The unveiling was casual. Facebook gets a facelift. Yet the backlash was anything but. An incensed user base saw this as an encroachment on privacy, voicing their dissent through petitions and protests that echoed, bring back the old Facebook. However, within the walls of Facebook HQ, metrics told a curious tale. Usage was climbing even among the loudest detractors. Facebook's seemingly clairvoyant understanding of user engagement highlighted the company's grasp on the intricacies of online behavior. Today, Facebook stands as the titan of the internet, a platform of unparalleled reach and influence. Yet, with great power comes great scrutiny. As Facebook steers the course of online interaction and societal discourse, questions loom over whether the early decisions of Zuckerberg and his circle, then just a group of young friends, were vetted with the appropriate foresight. The repercussions of these choices continue to shape the digital landscape and human relationships in profound and often unpredictable ways, a conundrum Silicon Valley and the world must grapple with in the times ahead. Final Summary In the grand narrative of technological revolution, Silicon Valley emerges not merely as a geographic locale, but as a cultural phenomenon. It's a place where serendipity collides with genius. Investment capital flows as freely as coffee and the eccentric is often synonymous with the visionary. This small cluster of cities and suburbs has transcended its physical boundaries to cast a colossal shadow over our contemporary lives. 
Here, the resolute fearlessness in the face of failure has birthed devices and platforms now as essential to our daily existence as the air we breathe. Silicon Valley soil has proved exceptionally fertile, nurturing ideas that bloom into innovations which reach billions across the globe. In a setting where the unconventional is the norm and where each failed attempt is a prelude to groundbreaking success, Silicon Valley stands unique. It's a testament to the magnetic pull of an environment that fosters boundless creativity and relentless pursuit. A place where the future is constantly being reimagined and reshaped. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then. Happy reading and happy listening.